Over the recent weeks, I've been reading the Nolan Variations book by film author Tom Schoen, which includes interviews that he conducted with the director, giving us a lot of information on Christopher Nolan's beginnings, his filmmaking style, and overall process. My last two videos in this series focused on how Christopher Nolan built a fascination over being a director and how he orientated the audience with the ideas he wanted to approach. In this video, I'm going to be reflecting on the third chapter of the book and focusing more specifically on the director's thoughts towards fighting time with references to Memento. But before I get into it, if you want to see more updates and videos on the work of directors like Christopher Nolan, alongside further videos on the Nolan Variations book, then don't forget to support this video by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel, and turning on your notifications. Also, feel free to check me out on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Instagram at Cortex Videos, which is all linked in the description below. But without further ado, let's dive into Christopher Nolan and his early fascination with time. So we begin this new chapter in the Nolan Variations by transitioning from the previous video essay which was based on how the director orientated his audience to the ideas he wanted to implement. We discussed how Nolan wanted to challenge the audience, but we also learned that the filmmaker was trying to work out how he would do that in a unique way. Well, in chapter 3, entitled Time, we begin to see the early transitioning into the director's first film, Memento, and how he started building the focus through orientation that we have seen develop throughout his career thus far. In the beginning of this chapter, Nolan references a real story in which him and his brother Jonathan Nolan failed to recognise the true details of a violent situation that they had witnessed. Jonathan Nolan expressed that he thought he was present at this memory, and Christopher Nolan stated that he couldn't remember if his brother was actually there. This leads into the formula of Memento, a uniquely structured neo-noir with scenes that run in reverse order, each one ending where the last began. It also derived from his brother's short film, and the key difference that the feature film version holds is that it realises how vulnerable Leonard's condition would make him, and how he could be exploited by others. Unlike Following, which he wrote in a straightforward fashion on his father's typewriter and then reorganised afterwards, Memento was written straight through so Nolan could experience it as Leonard does. As we said in the last video, Nolan wants to challenge the traditional point of view, but create one which is relatable and convincing at the same time. In the Nolan Variations interview for this chapter, he says, I wrote the script totally from Leonard's point of view. I would put myself in his position and start examining and questioning my own process of memory, purely subjectively, and the choices you make about what to remember and what not to remember. Once you start doing that, it gets a little tricky. The systems that Leonard employs were a very sincere and categorical response to, how do I live my life? Leonard systemizes this, and that's very much the way the script was written, extrapolating from my own memory process. This all comes back to exploring what is crucial about Nolan's fascination with film, and in particular, time. He goes on to say that it's back to this thing about fighting time. You're trying to break the tyranny of the projector, which is the ultimate linearity. Unlike following, he wrote Memento the way the audience would watch it. You have to be under the illusion that Leonard Shelby is under for the film to be bearable. It's using the noir framework to make it acceptable for a structure to take place, and that structure takes hold of the audience as they follow Shelby weaving in and out of his own memories. Along with challenging the perspective through time, he also kept familiarity with the trademarks of the genre, from the femme fatale to the rhythms of character and plot development. But while using these recognisable traits, it was telling the story backwards that became the eureka moments that Nolan needed, withholding the information from the audience the same way it is withheld from the character. 
Nolan explains that it was from this moment on that the idea for Memento poured out of him as he wrote the script pages in motels in Southern California, relating to the half of the movie that is in fact set entirely within the confines of a single motel room. He had completed the script and shown it to Emma Thomas, his wife and producer, who Nolan points out as crucial in giving him a response. She's very, very clear on what the audience are capable of taking in and when you're just spinning your wheels. Another eureka moment came following this that had Nolan thinking, well, Leonard has already done it and of course, that's the key and drive for the end of the movie. And when filming came along, the film was shot in a variety of locations in the LA area, from a diner in Burbank to a derelict refinery in Long Beach and a courtyard motel with prison-like bars on its entrances. Nolan was in search of gloomy locations to fit his noir story, giving an almost overcast and diffused sensibility. Something that feels like it's operating within the constructs of the character's memory and perceiving of time, with all the elements of the film fitting that tone. Along with cinematographer Wally Pfister, who Nolan had met at the Sundance Film Festival while showing following, Nolan had Memento shot on a Panavision Gold 2 camera with anamorphic lenses, a format usually used for epic landscapes rather than claustrophobic thrillers like the film he made. It was almost as if he was setting the frameworks for the bigger films he would make down the line, which would still encapsulate similar themes and usages of time. But the main reason this setup was used was for a focus on Guy Pearce's face with a shallow depth of field, allowing for Nolan to create a physical connection to Leonard Shelby. Creating this intimate feel between the audience and the character was crucial for the director and also a fitting comparison to the film's showcase of time and memory. Creating this intimate feel between the audience and the character was crucial for the director and also a fitting comparison to the film's showcase of time and memory, which he primarily deals with. Leonard's sense of memory is only proof that he exists, the one slim reason holding his identity in place. It's a feel of the world that the film presents through his viewpoint and the projector allows the audience to witness that through a projected period of time and make their own mind up surrounding the events that take place. The smaller details in the film and particular scenes only elevate this effect. Each scene begins the same way, with a distinct sound that allows us to identify it, whether it be Leonard putting the clip into the gun or Teddy knocking at the door to the motel. But after Memento's production was complete, it was time for Nolan to screen the film and try and get it on the circuit. A lot of producers passed on it, but ever so slowly, Nolan would get a reaction and after time of building that, the film was eventually picked up. Nolan describes the screenings of the film as himself listening to the rustles and the coughs of viewers in almost silence. But when the cut to black ending came around that Nolan has done so greatly in many movies that followed, he got the reaction he wanted. He describes viewers being in shock at what the film meant before seconds later giving a standing ovation. It's that essence that time in cinema can have on an audience that makes them think about something a little deeper and also make Nolan continue to be fascinated over its concept and effect. It's what Tom Schoen calls in this chapter a very Nolan-esque emphasis on a very Nolan-esque moment. Not the standing ovation itself, but the few ticking seconds of silence before the applause, when his fate is still hung in the balance. This relates to how Nolan structures his films and uses time in them to get the effect out of the audience themselves. Many directors have played fast and loose with chronology in their films of course, like Orson Welles, Steven Soderbergh and Quentin Tarantino, but no director of the modern era has laid such systematic siege to what he calls the tyranny of the projector. Following has three different timelines and cuts back and forth between them. Memento cuts back and forth between two timelines, one running forward, the other backward. The Prestige cuts between four different timelines. Inception cuts between five, of varying speeds, where five minutes asleep in the real world equals to an hour in the dream world. 
And with his latest film Tenet, we follow a protagonist through a period of time before coming backward through that same period, with the perception of time itself in particular sequences played backwards. Tom Schoen says that whole lifetimes can play out its surges and slippages, constrictions and convergences. Time is Nolan's great antagonist, his lifelong nemesis. He seems almost to take it personally. And Nolan is quoted saying that he does take it personally. It's terrible to say so, but your relationship with time changes over time, the flow of time. My view of it is very different now than it was when I started out. It's certainly more of an emotional issue now because time is accelerating for me. My kids are growing up and I'm getting older. I'm fascinated by the notion that we all feel the passage of time to be unfair to us, and yet we are all aging at exactly the same rate. And yet this also relates to the way a film has different effects between a filmmaker and their audience. Losing three or four years to creative projects that disappear in a couple of hours, film directors experience the flow of time at a different rate. They have years and years to plan and figure out what it is they are going to put in front of the audience, and then they have roughly two hours to watch and dissect the film. So to Christopher Nolan, the interesting factor is how movies work using time. He says that it's very indefinable. The different elements of the narrative run at different rates, but you accept it completely. There's kind of a dream logic. In that sense, film can be very dreamlike. It has a relationship to our own dreams that is difficult to articulate, but you're hoping to make connections and find things that are hidden from you all the while you are living your life or being in the world. I think dreams do that for us, and I think films do that for us. Memento is of course the ultimate glass watch, driven less by an urge to subvert or deconstruct, than by an urge toward radical transparency. Nolan continues in the closing pages, saying that he finds the idea of not being able to trust your own mind very creepy. The Shining is very much about that. I think Memento speaks to the moral relativism of film, which is very good at getting an audience to accept different moral codes than they would in everyday life. In Memento, you have a revenge fantasy in which the character cannot remember his own revenge. You have the internal set of ethics that are largely, in cinema, defined by the point of view. Then you have the experience, usually after you've seen the film, of reassembling your mind and going, what are the ethics of that if you step out of the guy's point of view? Memento is a film that tries to do that at various times within the film and tries to make that tension a part of the test. In other words, the film was made to be discussed and debated over. And this, of course, all comes back to Nolan's thoughts and fascinations on time. How he challenges the perspective of the audience using it, but also challenges himself to understand something better that cannot be fully understood. If anything, his latest film Tenet teaches us that although we may not be able to understand it, using the medium of cinema, we can still feel it. But they were the main details that Christopher Nolan and Tom Schoen gave in their interview for the third chapter of the Nolan Variations book. I personally really found it interesting to see how Nolan has essentially applied his feelings towards time throughout the course of his career and filmography. Tenor is of course the culmination of that fascination, and it will be interesting to see how he applies similar concepts in future movies. I would totally recommend buying the Nolan Variations if you are a fan of Nolan, and I will link it down below in the description if you want to buy a copy. But let me know down below what you think towards Christopher Nolan and how he implemented time in his early career, alongside the comments that he made in this interview. We continue to learn loads about him as a person, alongside being a great filmmaker, and I can't wait to read all of your thoughts on what was said.
For more updates and content on the work of directors like Christopher Nolan, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. I will be continuing this series on the Nolan Variations book every month with a video on each chapter, breaking down the different elements of his career and filmmaking style, so look out for whenever I post or update you on this content. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it, I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.